Oklahoma Gardening is a production of the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the land-grant mission of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University, dedicated to improving the quality of life of the citizens of Oklahoma through research-based information. Underwriting assistance for our program is provided by the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry, helping to keep Oklahoma green and growing. Today on Oklahoma Gardening, host Casey Hinches plants some tomatoes. We build a crisscross bamboo trellis. OSU Payne County Extension horticulturist Keith Reed gives an update on ongoing mechanical Bermuda grass eradication. OSU Extension plant disease diagnostician Jen Olson takes a look at some frost damage on vegetable plants. And Barbara Brown makes beef stew with green beans. It's finally time to start planting tomatoes in our garden. And so we've got a few of the All America selection varieties that we're going to plant. And this year we're gonna start off in our large um, box bamboo trellis that we've built with some that are gonna get about four to six feet tall. So they're gonna have plenty of support as they continue to get that height. We've got a few, uh, four different ones that we're gonna plant in here. Um, and the first one we're gonna start off with is called Chef's Choice. Uh, green and this particular one is going to get about four feet tall it is a traditional tomato so it's going to get to be like a large sort of a beefsteak like tomato um, but what's unique about this is this one's going to actually have yellow streaks to it and I'm going to go ahead and leave both of them for now uh, we still have some cold temperatures coming so just for the time being I'm going to go ahead and let both of those seedlings grow and we'll eventually come back and snip one of those off um, as we see that they're both surviving. Because we've got two in there, you can see. So this is Chef's Choice Green, and it's gonna have yellow streaks, but it's gonna be a larger uh, tomato. So as it grows up, we'll support it and we'll start attaching it to the sides here. The next one we've got is called Chef's Choice Black. Um, and this one is very similar to the Chef's Choice Green, only as the name implies, it's going to have more of a, I wouldn't say it's a full on black color, but it's gonna be more of a brownish color to it, but still, you know, a unique, interesting tomato. Um, and one thing I should have mentioned about this yellow one is it's gonna have more of a citrus flavor to it. Whereas this one's gonna be, again, like your beef steak. Now on this one, again, you can see I started these seedlings with two seeds in each little packet. So on that one, I'm leaving in case we have a freeze. I wanna show you another option that you can do, and that's to go ahead and plant them. But if they're so intertwined, what you might do is just get your snips and then um, decide which one you wanna keep, kind of tease them apart, the leaves apart. I'm gonna go ahead and keep this one. So I'm just gonna snip this one at the base and that will kill that plant, okay? So now we've decided that that's the one that we're gonna keep, um, and we've terminated the other one. We've got it planted in here. These are small, so I'm not gonna plant them any deeper than really what they already have been planted at. Although we know with tomatoes, we can plant them deeper if we'd like to. So the next one we're gonna plant, again, an All-America Selection variety called Apple Yellow. Um, and this one is going to produce a smaller, very traditional apple shape um, tomato. Uh, it looks like a traditional apple shape, um, but yet it is a tomato. It's gonna be smaller. Um, and you can see here again, we've got two. So another option to do if you have two is to try to gently, very gently, kind of just tease those two plants apart um, if you're wanting to save both of those. So. Um, you don't want to pull on the stems too much because again, if you were to tear or damage those stems, then you're going to basically kill in, uh, that plant. So you can see I'm barely doing anything and they are just falling apart there. So now I have two plants that I can plant both of those if I want to. So I'm gonna set one of them aside for right now and I'm gonna go ahead and plant this other one in here. Now the 
concern is is that you've kind of disturbed all of the root ball. We've lost the soil around it, so um, it doesn't have quite as much protection as what the other ones did if you just left them and planted them in there. So this one we might go a little deeper just because it doesn't have that root ball to support it. Break some of these dirt clods up around it. Um, and we're gonna go ahead and bury that in there. Again, this is called apple yellow. It's going to get about five to six feet tall. Have the small apple shaped yellow tomatoes, um, which are pretty meaty tomatoes and they're actually really good for stuffing for like an appetizer. Um, and another thing is it's gonna produce about a thousand of those little tomatoes if we're doing everything right. So I'm excited to see how this one produces. And then our last one that we're gonna plant in here is one that we planted last year um, called Midnight Snack. And it's a fun little tomato. Again, this is a small cherry type tomato, um, but it is going to produce a black uh, tomato for us. Um, and the way you can tell, it's kind of gonna ripen red at the base of it. Again, all the soil's been tilled, but you know, when you come back out, you kind of want to rough it up just again to allow those roots to get established. Um, we don't have very big of a plant here, so we don't have to do too much. Get that in there. Again, the nice thing about planting tomatoes is that you can plant them a little bit deeper, so you don't have to worry about planting them too deep. So with all of these, I've tried to create a little bit of a well, so when we water these, we know that the water is kind of going down to around the root zone. Um, we, of course, want to water these to get them established, um, to settle them in, and settle that soil around that root zone also. In no time we expect these tomatoes to be taken off and having to secure these to our bamboo trellis. another trellis design that we want to share with you all and this one is more of a vertical narrow design. What we did to start out with was we placed one pole at the end of our bed and then we laid another pole just to know how long we can take that trellis and so we basically built a straight square frame and then within that we measured the length of that. Now our poles uh, measured about 80 inches so we marked off about 16 inches we then uh, marked it both on the ground and on our pole up at the top. And then we just simply placed poles, bamboo poles, from one point to the other point. So we, you can see we've got them on a diagonal going from point A to point B and from point B to point C and so on and so forth. Then we came back and did the same thing on the opposite side. So by doing it on both sides, it kind of allowed a little more strength and stability within our frame. You can see this is very narrow, so it works in a lot of garden situations. Now for vegetables, you might look at growing cucumbers or peas or things like that that really want to vine up um, and allow that fruit to hang. So that works well for this. Um, you could also use it for tomatoes if you wanted to. Um, another thing that you could do with this is use it in an ornamental situation. A lot of times we have uh, annual vines um, that we just want to grow such as cardinal vine or scarlet runner bean or something like that and this works great for that. You could even put it right in a small narrow bed along a fence or something to again allow coverage of that fence but without having that stuff cling to your fence and damage your fence. It's pretty ornamental and it's a neat way to add some architectural interest to your garden.
Today we're here in Stillwater at the Gardens of Our Daily Bread Food and Resource Center. If you were with us last year when we visited this garden, you know this is a new community gardening project. And we've been at it now for just over a year. So I thought it would be a, a good time to, to come back and, and look at one particular project that uh, we think a lot of people are interested in. And that's our Bermuda grass control project using non-chemical means. So, uh, since last year, I, I'm going to say we've been moderately successful keeping our Bermuda grass under control. It's not 100% gone, as, as you're about to see, but we have been, uh, uh, I'm, I'm pleased with our progress. Now, uh, before you think, oh great, this is easy, it's very important for you to know that our garden here is, is roughly 7,000 square feet. And in that 7,000 square feet, we have spent in excess of 600 volunteer hours dedicated strictly to Bermuda grass eradication. So it's very important, uh, if you just have one take home message from this, this session, uh, it's important to know that uh, Bermuda grass removal and control is an ongoing project. You always have to stay on top of it or it's going to fail. Even if we don't see any Bermuda grass today, that doesn't mean it's gone. And, and we're, actually, uh, we're actually doing this segment the last week of March, and so the Bermuda grass is just waking up. So let's go over here and, and have a close look, and, and there's a couple of things I want to point out to you. So this area right here you can see is, is basically uh, wood chip mulch, and there are several layers of cardboard underneath this so we, we've got multiple layers of cardboard and then several inches of of wood chips on top of that and this is our third time let's see yes that's correct uh, since we began this last year on this particular section right here we've covered it with cardboard multiple layers added wood chips and then when the Bermuda grass starts crawling up through all of that and surfaces we've gone in raked it away removed the old cardboard, taken out all the live Bermuda grass, and then started all over. We've done that three times on this area over the last year. So right here, if you look closely, here's one little sprig of Bermuda grass that's popped up through the ground. You think, no big deal, I'll just pop that off and break that off and problem solved. But let's look a little closer here and see what we find. Look what we're starting to see here. We have a lot of, lot of uh, underground stems, which we call rhizomes, of course. Uh, some of these are kind of dark. That, that's probably dead right there. But this right here, that's fleshy, soft, pliable. That's a new plant ready to go. So right here we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, there's seven new Bermuda plants right here just waiting for sunshine and warm weather. So we're not even close to getting this killed off yet. Once again, we'll go in, pull the wood chips back, remove all of the live plant tissue that we can, and then start the process over again. If we dig a little deeper, the soil's really wet right now. We've had a lot of rain here in Payne County. But if we dig a little deeper, one of the benefits, the, the hidden benefits of, of the cardboard is it's actually helping improve the soil. So this is uh, actually pretty good soil for Payne County. Uh, it's heavy by ideal standards, but uh, if you look at this, even though it is, it is just saturated right now, you can see that it's, it's fairly loose and friable. So, uh, so a secondary benefit to, to using this method to kill off the Bermuda grass is, uh, is we're actually improving the soil here. So maybe in another couple of years, we can come along here and we can pull all of these wood chips back. We could come in here and dig off this improved soil, incorporate that into our raised beds, and then continue with our, our project. A uh, couple of other things that I, I want you to uh, be aware of before you tackle a project like this on home, and on, in your own garden is uh, over here we have a, a load of wood chips that have been supplied by a local tree service. Works really well for this. 
but that pile uh, is, a, is either number eight or number nine that we have used. So you understand that you're gonna be going through a lot of bulk of, of wood chips when you start a project like this. And then another thing is the cardboard. So here's an example of, of cardboard that, that we get here at Our Daily Bread. You know, it was made for produce, so it has a lot of holes in it. This right here is absolutely worthless for trying to keep Bermuda grass out because even if we fold it up or whatever we do with it, there's all kinds of places here for the Bermuda grass just to run in and around and out and it just doesn't work for us. So you want to go with, with uh, large pieces of cardboard. When you put one piece of cardboard over another, once again, this is not the correct material to use, but you can appreciate the example. Overlap it several inches to make it harder for that Bermuda grass to crawl over here, come up, and then crawl back because that's exactly what the stuff will do. Uh, uh, personally, uh, I like to find either utility boxes or, or if you, you have a local bike shop, someplace that, that uh, receives goods with, with enormous boxes, that's actually much more effective. Uh, so anyway, uh, I don't want you to think this, pro this can't not be done, but I do want you to understand that it's, it's, a, it's a challenge and it, it, it's an ongoing effort. So I hope you find this helpful. It's that time of year where we start playing the odds on is it okay to go ahead and plant my uh, vegetables. A lot of our vegetables like tomatoes, cucumbers, and squash are tender and so if we put those out too early and we have a late frost or a freeze they can be damaged. Uh, the other night we did have what was predicted to be possibly a frost or a freeze and so I took some plants inside to protect them while I left out a handful of other plants to see uh, and to, so I could show you what the injury looks like if we do have that late frost or freeze. So I have a couple of tomatoes a cucumber and a squash that are showing typical injury of cold temperatures. And then I have plants that are still healthy, the same type just for comparison. The kind of things that you often see are on tomatoes, you may see small brown uh, tan, necrotic is what we might call this, spots and flecking. You might notice that some leaves, the most exposed, show a little bit higher level of injury, even some curl or distortion. And you may lose some sections completely if you are uh, closer to a freeze. On cucumbers, tend to be even more sensitive. And so notice that some of the leaves on this cucumber have just completely wilted and are turning brown. And we see that same kind of browning and flecking. It usually occurs in between the major veins. Uh, similar injury on squash. The thing about this, usually these plants, if the damage is light, they will recover. They're going to be set back. It's gonna take a little bit of time. Um, and so that's one reason not to plant your plants out as soon. Um, or to do what I've done is plant them in a little bit larger pots that I have the ability to move in and out until that danger of late frosts and freezes has passed. Today we're making green bean and ground beef stew. This is a recipe that's very common in certain parts of the world, um, but not so much here, I don't think. So if you are in a Slavic country, you probably have had something similar. It may not have been with green beans. I have gone ahead and browned one pound of green uh, ground beef and I've taken it out of the pan. And now I've added a tablespoon of vegetable oil. It could be olive oil, canola oil, whichever one you have. And I'm adding a medium onion, about a cup, uh, to that and we're going to let that cook until that softens up just a little bit probably oh, close to four to five minutes 
I probably won't let it go that long while we're watching here so that we can move forward. But if you can use your imagination to assume that is gone for a little bit, the onion needs to soften, become a little bit translucent, a few minutes. Uh, and that's going to depend a little bit on how hot your pan was, how soon it is after you've taken the ground beef out to drain uh, until you get that back in there. Uh, we'll assume it's done it enough and I'm going to add uh, two cloves of garlic. I've got a little bit less than that today, uh, but you could use as much as you want. Two cloves gives it a nice flavor. You're going to let that cook for an additional 30 seconds or so just to uh, start to release some of the flavor, but not enough to actually cause the, the garlic to uh, brown. At that point, you can add the meat back to the pot. Notice we've broken it up as much as I could. And I put it on a paper towel to help drain any excess fat. Now, I didn't cook the two together, because I, uh, the onions and the ground beef, because I did want to be able to take out the meat fat and replace it with something that's a little bit uh, more nutritional, less, less saturated. So I'd used a, a canola oil in place of the meat fat. But we're going to end up with about the same amount of fat that we would have otherwise. So that's going to go back into the pot. And then I'm also to that, I have a can of diced tomatoes. You could use stewed tomatoes if, you, if that was what you had. You could also use whole tomatoes and break them up. Uh, that's going in there uh, along with some seasoning. Now this is what makes it more of a Mideastern. So this would be uh, Lebanese or Armenian, uh, somewhere in that area. We've got just a smidgen of nutmeg. That's about an eighth of a teaspoon of nutmeg. A teaspoon of ground coriander and a half a teaspoon of cumin. Other countries are going to use other, other flavors, other parts of the world. So if you didn't like it with these flavors, you could switch it over to something that's got more of a, a Caribbean flavor or an Italian flavor, uh, simply by changing the herbs that you, or the spices that you're throwing in it at this point in time. Also to that, I'm going to add four ounces of tomato sauce, and then about a cup of water. And I'm going to use that to rinse out some of the tomato sauce so that we don't lose as much of it. And then I'm going to add about a teaspoon of kosher salt, which would be the equivalent of a half a teaspoon of regular salt and a half a teaspoon of black pepper. And the rest of the water, which was a cup of water. I'm going to stir those together well and then I'm going to add the last ingredient to the pot, uh, which is green beans. Now I'm making this so that you can make it in the winter time. So I'm using canned, be uh, canned tomatoes, uh, canned uh, tomato sauce, uh, ev everything that you could use during the non-growing season. So I'm also using frozen green beans in this. You could switch all of those things to fresh if you wanted to. So get the last of these out of the pan. And when you use frozen, it may take a little bit longer to uh, cook because you've got to bring it up to heat. Uh, what we're going to do is bring this to a boil, uh, and then we're going to let it cook covered for about uh, 30 minutes. It depends on how much you want the green beans to soften. In some parts of the world, the acceptable green bean is going to be more done than it would probably be if you lived on the West Coast in the U.S. Oklahoma's kind of in the middle. We kind of come and go with that. Uh, crisp, tender, or cooked for a long time. Uh, and, and part of the reason for that is because in other parts of the world, they're serving different people than we're serving here. So if you're serving the elderly in a community, uh, you don't want things that are going to be crisp if those elderly are not going to be able to chew it. So uh, that's part of the reason for that. The other thing that you need to know about this, if you are going to cook it longer, is that this is not going to lose any water-soluble vitamins. Because this is a stew, we're going to eat the liquid that comes off with it, so anything that's water-soluble is just going to be in that liquid. Anything that is destroyed by heat, of course, you'll lose, so you might lose some of the vitamin C. Uh, but this is going to be nutritious uh, because we're going to eat everything that's in the pot and not leave things behind. Uh, so we'll let that come up to... Um, to a boil, which is starting to do, cover it and let it cook for about 30 minutes. When it's done to your satisfaction, whether it be 30 minutes, 40 minutes, or 20 minutes, uh, it's ready to go. Notice that we've got a lot of liquid that's come out of, of the ingredients that 
seems more to me always than what I started with. If yours, if you didn't cover it or whatever and you found you were running a little bit low on, on liquid, then feel free to add a little bit more as you go along. You can either continue adding water or in place of water you could have actually used some kind of a stock. The other thing that I didn't mention is that instead of ground beef, you could have used ground lamb, which be, would have been uh, more common in some parts of the world. So if you want to make something uh, a little bit more uh, actual to uh, other places, then ground lamb would be the way to go. Serve it over whole grain rice. If you've got whole grain, it'd be the, the preferred choice. This becomes a full meal. Uh, you've got just about everything except for the milk that you need on the side. I hope you'll try this one. It's green bean and ground beef stew. For Oklahoma Gardening, I'm Barbara Brown. Next week, Casey will direct sow squash and moonflowers. We'll build an inverted V bamboo trellis. OSU Extension Youth Specialist Shelly Mitchell will have a fun kids garden activity and we'll find out how to save on our grocery bill by buying whole chickens. We wish you health and wellness and we'll see you next week for more Oklahoma Gardening. To find out more information about show topics as well as recipes, videos, articles, fact sheets, and other resources, including a directory of local Extension offices, be sure and visit our website oklamagardening.okstate.edu And we always have great information, answers to questions, photos, and gardening discussions on your favorite social media as well. Join in on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can find this entire show and other recent shows, as well as individual segments on our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. And tune in to our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel to watch segments from previous hosts. Oklahoma Gardening is produced by the Oklahoma Cooperative Extension Service as part of the Division of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources at Oklahoma State University. The Botanic Garden at OSU is home to our studio gardens, and we encourage you to come visit this beautiful Stillwater Jewel. We would like to thank our generous underwriter, the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Additional support is also provided by Pond Pro Shop, Greenleaf Nursery and the Garden Debut Plants, the Oklahoma Horticultural Society, and the Tulsa Garden Club. <laughs>